my God. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's exciting. Happy birthday. Thank you. Now I'm officially 77. It's like double lucky numbers. That's what everybody says. I don't know anything about that, but it was a pretty lucky day. I got to go to the beach with Ellie and we walked about four miles in a sunny day on an uncrowded beach. And oh. a friend of mine had a house there that was empty for the weekend. So we got to change and do stuff. Yeah. And I still claim that if you think about it, every day is a day of birth. You get to start over every day. Or maybe it's you have to start over every day because you do. Super funny. I was listening to this podcast this morning about letting go. And you have that as one of your rules, actually, about mm -hmm. letting go. So we're going to talk about your rules today because it's your birthday episode. And we're going to talk about all things you. <laughs> oh, dear. That's a little scary. <laughs> No, because birthdays are a big deal in my house. And I feel like oh. since I'm a co-host of this podcast, I can celebrate you. Okay. And it was really strange last week, not having you, not having a quote or a, a, a track that I could try and follow or come back to. I know because you don't like structure, but I think you actually do quite well with it. <laughs> oh, I you have to have structure. Structure allows you to be flexible. Oh, that was too early to do a big brain explosion, but <laughs> I know structure allows you to be flexible. How can you write poetry unless you language? The beauty of poetry is that it surprises you. Yes. A, a thing that you expect from words or from a flow. And one of the beauties of poetry is Italy poem, E.E. E. Cummings. I, that's one thing I remember from high school English. There we go. Wow. Did that get us off track? Sorry. <laughs> we just took a, a deep dive there for, for a bit. That's okay. That's okay. We've got a, we have a happy birthday balloon to lift us up when we need to. Thank you very much. There's a ton of structure in the core. There has to be structure. There has to be rules and regulations and a foundation upon which we have to build upon and layer and, and travel. You have to start with the structure so that you can experiment and be creative within a framework that allows you to be both safe and effective. You're welcome and I'm sorry. <laughs> because one of your rules, I'm gonna go all over the map with it. You've, okay. you've got 12 rules that you have as a screen saver and- yep. One of the ones that I love is be a student of easy. Mm -hmm. And why I want to start with this one is because learning FSM can be extremely overwhelming and it doesn't need to be. And it's easy at the same time. What tissue is it? What's wrong with it? Exactly. One slide. We have to run out of the building and you have a list of frequencies and the rest of it is just me sharing mileage. Right. And so to go back to your structure, the structure allows the flexibility. I think in the years that I've been involved with it, the most um, exciting and profound moments are when you talk to other practitioners and you hear based on whether their profession, their background, their mileage, what they're doing with the frequencies. And that's when your brain starts exploding all over again. Yeah. The most exciting part. <clears throat> yes. What is your favorite rule out of your rules? Do you have one? It really depends. It has to work for everyone or it doesn't work. That's a big one, especially for those of us who work with a lot of practitioners or even just when you're working one-on-one -on -one with a patient it has to work for both of you or it doesn't work yeah and that's a corollary of rule number three which is there's always a win solution right and you win 
And sometimes our culture is organized around, I win, you lose. And that always leaves one person feeling less than and one person feeling one up. And that's just icky. It is icky. Rule number one and rule number three go together. Yep. And then when I posted these, I guess on my birthday, I had a friend of mine from college post that rule number 12 was unrealistic. Life isn't that way. Rule number 12 is everything is going to be okay. And he said, he's my age. And he said, I'm pretty beat up and I'm not well or whatever was going on with him. He didn't go into a lot of detail. And I said, that's the corollary of rule number 12. Everything is going to be okay is rule number two, which is what you need always shows up, but it doesn't always look like what the way you thought it would. So when you look at my medical history, it's really appalling. But look how much I learned by being injured or being sick and having the blessing of having the right people in my life to teach me how to recover from those difficult, weird conditions. Mary Ellen Chalmers, Neil Nathan, John Reskey, George, uh, what you need always shows up. It just doesn't look like what you thought it would. So health history, employees that embezzle from you. Okay, you survive it. And that takes you to number six, forgive, but don't forget, or they'll do it to you again. And also number seven, which is get over it if you resent it or regret it, they won. So just let love win. Okay, we have to unpack a couple of these before we go any further. Okay. So <laughs> I think when we have practitioners, the, those of you who are treating chronic pain patients, they can bring a lot of resentment into the appointment, especially the first appointment. There is a laundry list of symptoms. There's a laundry list of misdiagnoses or rabbit surgeries, holes. That they, or surgeries what? they didn't need, surgeries that went bad, people that dismissed them. Yes. There is a lot. And I have learned in the short time that I've been seeing these patients that when they do that, I don't want to say dump, but they when they load you with that information, you have to put up almost like this force field of, I'm sorry that happened to you, but we're here today to try something new to see how I can complement what you are doing to get better. There's that. And... There are times when during their history, as they're telling me all this stuff, I used to just lose it. And then I found out that's not a great idea. So now my response is, they did what? Okay. Wow. Okay. We're going to move on from that. So there's a, a moment or a brief way you can validate it, validate the fact that they were mistreated, misjudged, judged, and move on. It's wow, that yuck. Okay, we're just gonna put a pin in that and what's next? I heard a quote, a little while ago that kind of piggybacks on that, that one of the most key components to rumination in a negative cycle is when we're not seen and we're not heard. Exactly. And so when you have somebody that's know something is wrong and traditional allopathic medicine is 
not identifying the cause. And they're told it's all in their head. The pain doesn't match. So it's psychological or it's this and it's that. So I think it's so important to give them that moment of, I'm hearing you, I'm seeing your history. You're right. This has been quite the journey for you, but not staying in it because right? it doesn't serve anybody. Which, yeah, sitting in a pity pot just doesn't do any good. The other thing that happens because of the way what we cover in the core is it, the answer is always in the history and the physical. What do we say that? Six, eight times. Thank you, Dana. Six, eight times. It's always in the history and the physical. We are taught to do a history and a physical. Yeah. I did a whole thing in Hawaii on a pinwheel. We did a whole diagnosis with just a pinwheel. Yeah. And then there was a C2 hyperesthesia on one side and then a couple of other nerve roots. And we had no history. We started with the pinwheel. And then she gave us the history I said, when did you whip your head back and smash the C2 nerve root on the right? She said, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. And because we do a history and a physical, it gives us the information that we need to know what to treat and where to look. For example, I had a patient last week who was in an auto accident a year ago. And she's seeing upper cervical chiropractor, very gentle, strain, counter strain, physical therapist that somehow has something to do with bumps on the head. I d That's a good face because I don't get it either, but she says it works. And she said, and my thoracic, my trunk is really tight and my neck just doesn't feel right. Nobody had done flexion extension films. Nobody had done APO on side bending. She had a cervical MRI that showed four disc bulges. Nobody had done a thoracic MRI. And she was in a Jeep Cherokee that was hit on the driver's side front corner by a Corvette. She was at a stop sign. She was hit by a Corvette doing 120 miles an hour. Spun 360, she has a vestibular injury that wasn't diagnosed. C1 is unstable, we know now. And it's just okay. And she doesn't want to be hurt. She's never been injured before. She's not an athlete. We need documentation. And it's all because in order to do FSM, you have to know what you're treating. Right. It's if... All you do is put red light laser on it, and that's all you do. Then you don't need a physical exam. You don't need a history. You don't need to match things up. And I, I think that's where it can become overwhelming because, oh. but it's like what we said a couple of podcasts ago. I said it forces you to be better and you're just like, no, it allows you, or it, you said it in a more positive way. We're, like I said, we're all coming at FSM from a different background, different educational background, different just life background, mileage. I think the longer you practice, the more you realize you don't have all the answers and that's okay to not have the answers. Where the growth happens is the people that you had mentioned that FSM has brought into my life where I have five people on speed dial if I should need anything or if I need clarification or if I can send somebody. And I think that's where the professionalism, that's where the gift really is, is a community that we have from veterinarians to like neurosurgeons, like where on earth would you ever have a modality that can help so many different people? Exactly. Yeah. I was talking to somebody about coming to the advanced and it's like, it's the one place in the world I don't know any other technology or any other discipline that has such a wide range of professionals everything from massage therapists to neurosurgeons yeah. neurologists internists nurse practitioners MDs DOs PTs OTs and they all speak the same language 
and they all have the same goal, which is to help patients. It's like, how cool is that? So cool. <laughs> Your background, you have two backgrounds. They all complemented where you are right now between being a pharmaceutical rep and then your psychology counseling and then chiropractic three extremely different fields, but all blend together beautifully because you can pull from those three different areas. And, and I went to a chiropractic itself. college that is very medically oriented. And so I can speak to MDs because I lived in medicine and hospitals for 16 years. And then I know pharmaceuticals, everything except antibiotics and psychotropics. And then the psychology part has been really helpful. But the other part is theater. I started in children's theater when I was 12, 13, something like that, and was in theater until I was 30 something. I did a production. I was in the chorus. Choruses are easy, but I was in a production of South Pacific when my daughter was 18 months old, 14 months old. She came to rehearsal every night. It's hilarious. And that makes it easy to talk and explain things and makes you comfortable in crowds. And I went down this road for a couple of different reasons, but to spin off of how we all take a different, I think we all take a different initial approach to treatment. And it still takes me forever that it's not the muscle, but if you're only able to treat a muscle or connective tissue that is going to be your default and that is okay until you learn that it's not okay and you're only going to get so far thinking with that tunnel vision and I think that happens with a lot of different what's that saying when all you have is a hammer everything is a nail FSM gives you this like Mack truck of tools that gets dumped onto your front lawn in one week. <laughs> and you're like, where's the hammer? Just give me the freaking hammer for a minute. Yeah, exactly. Like, Until what lands on your table it needs a hex wrench. Exactly. And that gives me another one of your quotes. Where did it go? I was going to piggyback on this. Choose yes, unless no is a better choice. Oh, yeah. So that was like me going, choose the muscle, unless there's a better choice. I have to tell you a story that happened today. I dropped my car off at the dealership. They called an Uber to get me home. And the Uber driver is a very nice lady. And she's got tape. What's the stretchy tape that you do? ACO tape or KT tape, or rock yeah. tape, any of those, right. yeah. KT tape. I have to learn how to do that, by the way. Anyway, so she had that on her elbow, and I said, oh, do you have tendonitis? She said, yeah. And I said, and it was right here, right there, right? And I said, you know, that always starts in your neck, right? And she said, now that you mention it, it did start after I got hit by a forklift and then two weeks later 200 pounds of chicken fell on my neck and yeah and I said and you wouldn't happen to have some soreness in your thumb yeah my thumb and my index finger is huh so I told her about c6 and this is c6 and I said then take a paper clip and just drag it along your skin from here to your thumb and index finger on your right arm, and then do the same thing on your left arm and see if they feel the same. Oh, they don't. There you go. So here's what you ask your MD for. And there's the website, find a practitioner. But even, like I said, I always go back to the shoulder and this one really drives me crazy is everybody will come in pointing to pain in the anterior dowel or the lateral GH. And that's all anybody treats. And that is the last place you should be doing an exam because 
it's never the GH joint. It's coming from the neck. It's coming from the thoracic scapulo articulation. Subscapularis. Absolutely. Yes. Primarily, it's going to be subscap, subscapular nerve. It's going to be that entire area. But because somebody points to an area, everybody tends to zero in on just that area. And it's just leave it alone. It's not the problem. I see a ton of shoulder people manifesting them somehow because I keep talking about frozen shoulder and how I like drives me crazy. So the universe just keeps dropping them into my clinic. And I had a patient a couple of weeks ago that was so upset that 40 minutes had gone by and I hadn't palpated the area that she said was sore. And I had to explain, I go, I understand that area is causing you the pain. And all you have to do is a quick upward rotation or upper extremity test where you have them touch the backs of their hands up over top of their head. And one arm goes here and one arm goes here. And the arm doesn't go because the scapula can't allow for the arm to float up off the rib cage. And that was my bad. I didn't explain everything as thoroughly as I could. She had a lot of things going on, including like a C5, 6, and 6, 7 disc. Huh. And if once I explained it, it doesn't have a five, six, six, seven disc. No, uh -uh. Nope. no, but at least there was imaging. So I could show her, I'm like this, and you've got the cute poster on the clinic that shows the referred pain. I'm like, the reason why the pain is here. And the reason why the arm doesn't move is because of the scapula, but still she wanted me to just treat the arm or the delt. And I, I have no problem doing that. And it feels good to do a little soft tissue effleurage on it. And I go, at this point, it's just making you feel better, but it's not treating the cause. And from what your history has been, you've spent years just chasing the pain and not chasing the cause. Well said. But again, like having that confidence to say that where I was doing that before FSM, I was doing my assessments and I was trying to figure things out on my own, but with frequency, it helps just hone in on what you need to do first scarring in the nerve. Oh, the pain is gone. Yeah. Because it's scarred in there. And some people will get caught up in what came first, the chicken or the egg. Was it the disc or did the arm freeze? And I always say it doesn't really matter. We're going to treat both and exactly, it'll get better. Yeah. So I don't know where I went with one of your rules, but it was whatever. Oh, yes. And less no is a better choice. Yeah. Choose yes. nerve and less muscle is a better choice. <laughs> you just wrapped around rule number 10 clear, clear agreements make successful relations agreement you made with your patient was we don't write this down but my job is to fix your shoulder and the way you put it was perfect they've injected it they've treated this and the reason it's still not better after two, three, four, six, 12 years, usually it's two, three years, is that's not the cause. My right. job is to fix, do what you want me to do, which is to make this pain go away. But in order for that pain to go away, I'm going to put my finger in your armpit and I'm going to run a machine to help the discs in your neck. What discs? That's where you do this little pokey thing here. Does that hurt? No. Does this hurt? Yeah. Okay. That makes the agreement clear. The, these are all relate to, that's one of the nice things about being 77. You've already made most of the mistakes that are possible in life one way and another. You survived them. You're going to make different ones, but that's where all the rules came from. The one that I always think about is when, as a person that likes to have control, this line of work can be challenging at times, especially with the amount of athletes that I work with. It is a lot of pivoting and adapting and having to just 
go and come on a moment's notice. And so your number two, what you need always shows up, but it doesn't always look like the way you thought it would. I will relate that a lot to patients in treatment because a lot of times they have seen everybody under the sun and have not gotten better. And they become a little shocked that the little machine that they can't hear or feel is helping them feel better. And so one of the, the best lines I heard was, you have to be open to creative solutions. Oh, I like that. Yes. And that's exactly what you're saying. Sometimes it's just not what you imagined it to be. And there's always something to learn. And that leads you to number five. So yes. when I think back to the practitioner I was in 1997 through about two years ago, I, there are some patients where I want to go back and find them and say, I know what I should have done 18 years ago. Come back, find me. And so you got to let yourself off the hook. Everybody does the best they can at the time with what they have. Right. Even think about in the last five years, how much we talk about the vagus nerve versus before when I started. Oh, 10 years ago, I said, don't touch it. But I, Diana Cross changed my life when she came up and did that presentation on the vagus. And I found out I have to treat the vagus. I'm scared to death to treat the vagus. Okay, I'm going to experiment on myself. So I sat on the couch with a pulse ox meter and I ran 81 and 109. Oh, and my pulse went from 64 to 62 and back up to 64 and stayed there. Okay. So, yeah. Isn't that cool? It is cool. And the fact that we're always still learning, I think, and you are still open to all different solutions. And I think that's the, the best way to teach everybody else is to lead by example, right? Not just do as I say, do, or do as I do, or however, whatever that is. Because when you were treating me in Kona, treating scarring in the appendix was like, what? <laughs> I am literally, I had never, ever done that before. Never. Especially not for when I bring my hip up, it externally rotates. What's that about? I wonder. It's the sock puppet. I wonder. It couldn't possibly be. It might be scarring in the appendix. What makes you think that? Feel it. Okay, fine. <laughs> we need to get the FSM blue sock for you to actually and get eyes on it to do that because those are the conversations that you have in your head. And sometimes the idea just gets plopped into your head and you're like, where did that come from? And then I'm like, forget it. I don't care where it came from. I'm just grateful that it's there. Let me try this. And, and then, I'll try it. And it's either going to work or it's not. But if it doesn't work, then one thing it's not right and it, it is about choosing that hypothesis based on your assessment all right we've got some questions and comments we're gonna we've have to lots. let's get to those some happy birthdays yes thank you very much wait a minute 16 year old son had an emergency resection surgery terminal ilium appendix cecum blockage of the terminal ilium of the visual whoa yikes Yikes. Yikes. Inflammation was indicative of Crohn's, but the pathology lab did not come back as Crohn's. Came out of nowhere. Okay, wait. So he did have the surgery? Yes. Resection, blockage. So Dana, he did have the surgery. Yeah, you're going to have to do a little summary for the people who are listening right now. Okay. okay. Uh, to emergency resection, the CT scan revealed a blockage of the terminal ilium with a visual of a bowel perf perforation and a fistula into a later section of the large intestine. The body bypassed the blockage on its own. That's miraculous. 
There's no sign of anything until the stomach pain and vomiting one day before the ER. Inflammation was indicative of Crohn's, but they're not sure. Came out of nowhere. FSM maintenance diagnostic for Crohn's. History of gastroenterologists doing more harm than good. Welcome to the club. So signing off on the emergency surgery was difficult, hard to trust prescriptions or absolutely necessary. So emergency surgery was obviously necessary. I'm assuming he doesn't have a colostomy and because there's inflammation and they're thinking about Crohn's, the prescriptions are immune suppressants. And that's the tricky part. The, this t funny you should mention the vagus, Kim. So here's the thing. It's not possible to have an autoimmune disease, as far as I can tell, if your vagus nerve is working. And the vagus nerve is turned off by infection, stress, and trauma. In order for the fistula to have formed and terminal ileum appendix and cecum, if you look at those structures, they generally are the home of parasites. And parasites will create inflammation because the immune system attacks them. <clears throat> And I have an opinion about immune suppressants. They fail to mention that immune suppressants aren't forever. Any given one will last any place between six months and two or three years, and then you need a different one, and then you need a different one. And in the meantime, because they block TNF-alpha, primarily, the patients are susceptible to infection, fungal infections, bacterial infections, and cancer. So avoiding immune suppressants in my world is a good thing. So what I do, if you have that option, Dana, is do a stool test and see if you can yeah, Humera, it, that's the one. Yeah, mm, if you can avoid it, especially since it didn't come back 100% as Crohn's, then they're throwing it on the wall and seeing if it sticks. Do a stool test and look for parasite DNA and treat his belly with FSM, get his vagus working, and see if you can pin down infection, stress, or trauma. What turned it? What turned the vagus off? Turn the vagus back on. We have a protocol for Crohn's. It's not that hard. That's how I came to write the resonance effect, by the way. This editor at North Atlantic Books called me and said, I've had Crohn's disease for 17 years, and one of your practitioners just put me into remission in two weeks, and I want to know why I haven't heard of you. Why don't you have a book? And I said, because nobody ever asked. And he said, I'm asking. Oh. The protocol we have for Crohn's is fairly effective. It's just, especially now that we have the vagus piece of it, I always wait for lightning to strike when I say this, but it's just not that hard. Yeah, that's where I'd go with that. Hold off on the Humera if you feel comfortable doing that, especially if it didn't come back 100% as Crohn's. Of course, there's inflammation, especially if there's a parasite. Asian food, foreign travel, and I do a stool test and see if there's still parasite DNA any place in there. Next one. You have quite a bit of knowledge concerning neuropsychology. What is your take on DSM and the other diagnosis tests for things such as autism, ADHD, noticing that it has become trendy to be neurodivergent? And these tests don't seem to address that influence. Yeah, exactly. I didn't get diagnosed with ADD until about two, three years ago when my children told me, mom, you're so ADD. What? How do you even know if you're ADD? You take these tests. So I took one and it put me halfway into the red. And I went, 
<laughs> took another one, four tests. And then I took, printed them off and I took them to my GP and I said, what do you think? So she put me on ADD medication and I didn't notice any big difference. So I'd been on it for about two years and then I ran out. And then the manufacturers are back ordered on Vivant. And so after a week of being off of it, it's, oh, this is what it's like to be ADD. I thought ADD people were just smarter than everybody else. So we process things faster. It's starting five things at once and finishing some of them. It's all sorts of, and interrupting. That's the other thing. <laughs> yeah, the tests are geared. Dana, that's a, a good thing. The autistic spectrum is a whole different world. Sensory processing dis disorders and what leads to them and how hard they are to diagnose and treat. I was raised with the DSM and the DSM is like ICD-10. So Diagnostic and Statistics Manual are, is psychology diagnoses. And that's the hilarious part of working on a master's in psychology or even having your bachelor's in psych is sophomore psych students have every diagnosis that they run across in abnormal psych classes. Oh my God, I did that. So the DSM, if you look at it, it's really subjective. And it's like the ICD-10, you have to call it something. So the patient comes in with lateral epicondylitis and we add to that cervical disc and C6 neuritis in addition to tendonitis, tendinopathy. So they have to call it something. They come in with pain in their feet. So they're diagnosed with plantar fasciitis when what they are is a 40 and 10 patient. What they have is pain in their feet. So there you go. I don't even remember who asked that question. Click on answered. It was there. Oh, it's anonymous. There are some trendy diagnoses. So like SIBO is the new candida. Oh, I have a question. Yes, go. No, not my question, but I was posed a question here. Kim, what is your favorite frequency to use on very tight muscle building guy that needs to gain range of motion? So there's so many places you can go and you're taking a deep breath. And yeah, because right away, I go back to a study that Charles Poliquin did back in the day on certain bodybuilders trying to gain muscle. It was based on the hamstrings and certain athletes were the hypertrophy couldn't happen because the fascia was too tight. So the hypertrophy, like the muscle fibers, the, the breaking apart and the repair that happens when muscle fibers get bigger, couldn't happen because the fascia had almost encapsulated the macro part of the muscle. It's just fascinating study. So when I hear of muscle building or bodybuilding type people, my first inclination is always to go to the fascia because the fascia has to be healthy and pliable for muscles to grow. So if you have somebody that is already a bodybuilder and is very tight, that is a recipe for disaster as it is, because it's like expanding where there's no place to expand. And when the fascia won't allow the muscle to go, the next thing that's going to blow is the muscular tendinous junctions. Those are going to be, so then you get the tendinopathies, you get the, all those other things. So if somebody needs to gain range of motion, my first question is where, what part of the body and why is it restricted? Cause it's not as easy as just scarring in the nerve or, or the fascia or the fascia. There's a reason why the range of motion. Okay. And again, let's go simple and then we can get complicated. Range of motion is restricted for only two reasons. Something is scarred or something is inhibited. There's only two ways. Maybe also muscle balance. Because 
my limited experience with bodybuilders, uh, casual weekend warrior bodybuilders, they want to build up their pecs. And so doing a lot of this, but they don't have balance in the posterior shoulders. So the range of motion gets limited because they can't stabilize. Everything is forward because For sure. of what they're building up. But I think that still boils down to something is inhibited or weak, right? So either there's a weakness there for some reason, either it's inhibited or of programming yep. or of deconditioning. So there's something is weak and something is tight. There you have two options to go. Yep. FSM. So when I teach the sports course, I'm like, if you can just boil things down to two options, that limits literally the frequency list in half. Yep. Because if something is restricted due to tightness, right away, you should be thinking, okay, for your A channels, it's scarred, it's calcified, it's fibrotic. There's adhesions there limiting the motion. If there's a weakness due to imbalance or inhibition, then you want to start thinking about central nervous system, peripheral nervous system. Can we increase the secretions? How do we increase the activity to that nerve impulse or that motor junction? And scarring on the nerve. And the other thing about athletes, is, especially in my limited experience, is they're athletes because they scar so well and they calcify they scar and they calcify so it gets scarred and it gets hard and yep. that's it cuts the frequency list in half so then it's like where where do i go okay so what if the range of motion is inhibited by years of major rugby injuries oh geez rugby is like being in a massive car accident every single week you wear no padding I would say, no, you're not out of luck if it was many years ago. It's just going to take a little bit more digging and freeing up to release some of the scar tissue that's built up over time. And you have to be careful in those really chronic cases. It's just like somebody who has been in a car accident many years ago. You don't want to dissolve all the scar tissue that's been holding a joint together. You're going to do it bit by bit, and you're going to use corrective exercise to help restabilize an otherwise pretty unstable joint. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure I've been playing around with time dependency with fascia. I do like to run frequencies on fascia for a long period of time, mm -hmm. especially like we know 124 is time dependent. I have no problem running vitality for an extended amount of time. I love running 49 in the fascia, 81 in the fascia, and it just feels good, especially after a treatment that you've taken out. Again, this goes back to Roger Billica. You have to put in the good and take out the bad. There, It's like, I have a slide on the sports advanced course of a manual transmission when you're learning how to drive standard for the first time. And there's that feeling of taking your foot off the clutch and putting your foot on the gas. This is how I, I look at the balance of taking out the bad before putting in the good. So I don't know if that helps. Well, and when we do the, speaking of practicums, we're doing a two-day practicum at the Trapdale campus. We have to get the signs up on the windows, but doing a two-day practicum at the Trapdale campus, September 16th and 17th, for people that have taken the course on video or even people that took the course years ago, you can sign up for the two-day practicum and update your skills just on the practicum part but we finished the supine cervical practicum just when you thought the neck muscles couldn't get any softer. You won 81 and the fascia and they turned to jelly. It's what I call in sports advanced science calls it the floof phenomenon. Floof. <laughs> because it, for the first time I experienced it, it was supine cervical suboccipits that I felt that happen. And that was a religious experience because you're right. Just when I thought at ah, smush, this was a whole other level. Yeah. Debbie, we need FSM here in Great Britain more than it is. This is true. How can I help spread the word? I'm hoping we can spread the word. You let me know because we're going to be in London next year in September. We're going to Austria in September and we're going to be in London either before or after. We just haven't decided which. 
And I don't know how FSM always spreads best by word of mouth. Because otherwise, why would you believe that it's possible? You You're right. Know? Yeah. I, there we go. Louise had a, a question or a series of, of symptoms, it looks like. For about a month, she has a light shake of either hand when holds an object, even a light one like a piece of paper or glass. Happens at the end of motion when I stretch the arm holding the object to carry or deposit. Um, has a bit of numbness at the tip of left index finger and middle fingers on the left hand only. If it happens with both hands, then it can't be related to the numbness on just the left. So it happens with both hands. And index finger and middle finger sixes, the thumb and the index finger. End of range. What do you think, Kim? I don't know, because I was stumped when I thought I had an idea when I read the first part, but then when the numbness on the tip of the left hand kind of threw me for a loop, because you're right, it, it goes from something being bilateral to unilateral, and that's a completely different. Yeah. Louise, I would head for cerebellum or basal ganglia. Resting tremor is basal ganglia, right? Yeah. Tension tremor is as you reach for something. So if you head your finger to your nose, does your hand shake more as you head to your nose? The end range, that part's not classic. That's not ringing any bells. Yeah, I'm at a bit of a... Oh, good. A loss. Thank you. I'm glad. Oh, so no for her nose. Then try the cerebellum. And I'd have to think about that one. Either hand. Have somebody do your knee reflexes. Knee reflexes, yeah. That's how to find out how the neck and the thoracic spine are doing, is to check the knee reflexes, which I think confuses people. Yes. Is there any uh, other questions before? Also, I've taught me, yikes, we have five minutes. I know. So, so Neliacus is so much included in my treatment. Oh, yeah. That's this. The iliopsoas is, I don't know, it, is it ever not the ureter in the kidney? Is it ever not? I don't know. Thank you. Because it. I keep waiting for it to be, yeah, I'd try 81 in the cerebellum and see if it helps, Louise. I keep waiting for it to be something besides 13 and 60, scarring in the ureter. And then when you check the psoas, it's also, all, also never not the QLs. I no. think even on you, right? Yeah. And, and the, the QLs are those funny muscles where they're not major primary movers. They're, they act as stabilizers for the ribs and the pelvis. They're never the problem, but they will hold a condition. So... Again, going back, it's never the muscle. Like for sure, the QLs didn't become tight from outer space, but that doesn't mean you ignore them and just hope they're going to get back to their normal fluffy self. Sometimes you do have to go in and do some manual therapy, give a release to them at the end. But a lot of the times they're, like I said, they're tight because of scarring in the ureter. They're right on top of the kidneys. Scarring in the kidney and sclerosis in the kidney fat pad. Yes. And then it's because the psoas is the front and the QLs are the back, as far as your cerebellum is concerned. Their job is to protect the ureter, protect the kidney. Yeah. Where I love teaching is just the manual setup and showing people all the different ways you can access it that are different than jabbing a hook or a ball or a brick or whatever people end up trying to jab into their hip flexors to release them 
when all they're doing is causing more scarring and more inflammation and the cycle just keeps repeating. So there, there is a better way. Totally. There's a better way. So I love the sports rehab is the second core. It's the follow-up because you, you take the complicated structure that we, I have to do in the core for which I'm truly sorry. But then you make it pragmatic and usable and fun. And you get people thinking about how to implement it, which is so important. Thanks. Yeah, I think I I want the takeaway to be like, okay, now I know what to do on Monday when all these patients are going to come back in. Or at least I have some new strategies in which to put it together. Speaking of the sports course, we are at half already for Arizona as far as registration goes. Whoa, so cool. But yeah, I just opened it up and I, I saw it this morning. So it is March 4th and 5th for the sports course. And then March 6th is the sports advanced. Mm -hmm. and. We layer it nicely in between the core and the advanced. So you could really just overload your brain, but it's so much fun. You can sign up on the FSM sports 365 website for that one. That's going to um, be so fun. Did he make a good point here? Really? Does, that, does but, that mean we get to do the podcast in person? Yes. I'm so I, excited. He, we totally geek out in Arizona because I really do feel like I'm like, Regis and Kelly or whatever like the talk show is because it's just so strange to talk to you when you're right here so part of me likes this because I can see you and I feel like we're having a cup of coffee just with other people but there's just this amazing energy that happens at the courses in Arizona and it's so hard to describe you have to come yeah it's there's just nothing like it and I made the advanced three days because I never finish into half days. And then we still have expert speakers in the afternoon. And we are going to have clinician case reports, just so everybody knows. I know this is September already, but I, George's house just sold last Friday. And I don't have the schedule yet for the advanced. So soon I'll start making emails and putting this afternoon speakers together. And I'm going to put out a call for case reports. So we'll do at least three or four practitioner case reports in between the expert lectures. So you're going to be lecturing one afternoon. Okay. And do you want to do a three hour morning? Sure. Yeah. You put oh. me where you need to. Huh? You put me wherever you need to. Okay. All the time, everywhere. So that's coming up and I'll get all that done before we leave for Australia and Taiwan in October and November. Yes. There we go. Yes. I just want to make sure we, we got all the questions and comments that we needed to. I think so. A lot of fun things. We are adorable. Yes. We are exciting. Oh, and thank you, Louise. That's very nice. Oh, that's true story. Kim is definitely part of the team. I'm adorable. I, I have a very nice quote today for okay. your birthday. Okay. This was the print. For those of you watching on YouTube, JJ had sent both of us this print of Honan out in Hawaii. And Carol, you had talked about this place and I was like, yeah, it's Hawaii. Of course, it's great. This place is different. I had a experience. That's all I can actually say without all the feelings coming up but it was just very nice JJ sent both of us a print of it and so I right now it's right here for today um, I'm not sure if it's going to stay in this spot over my shoulder but it's going to be in a beautiful spot in my can clinic we, if I move this little oh there it is oh good I just had to move the Q&A thing yes that this picture over her shoulder Hono now was the place of refuge it was the place of forgiveness Everything in Hawaii was punishable by death. And if you could make it to the temple at the place of forgiveness with the posse hot on your trail, 
everything was forgiven, you start over. And somebody got a picture or maybe Photoshopped it with the Milky Way behind it. And it's, yeah, there's just no words. No. So next year, we are going to do a masterclass in, in Kona again. Thanks to Derek. Thank you, Derek. And but a close up of the pic. I'll try to bring it close without the glare. There you go. That is a little god. And this black square over here is the temple itself. And it's surrounded by a fence. And there's tall tiki's. And then there's the Milky Way and palm trees because that's where the kings lived. And then there's that big stone table where they did ceremonies. So there's a an energy, a sacredness about the place that's palpable. Next podcast, I'll, when I did my tour, there's a sign, there's a big stop sign that stops you. And there are steps and rules that you need to have. And one of them is asking for permission to enter the grounds and only bringing your positive energy. Um, so to me, that's what kind of got me right when I started was this, okay, here we go. So the quote that I had, I actually was reading, I was reading a book while I was in Kona. It's on creativity. It's way lateral than what I normally read. So the quote that I found while I was mid Kona said, there is a reason we are drawn to gazing at the ocean. It is said the ocean provides a closer reflection of who we are than any mirror. Amazing. Yeah. And I really felt that when we were there, what a gift that masterclass was and that group and the energy on the island, it was forever changing. So I know it's your birthday, but I feel like I received the gift. So oh, thank you. Thank you. Me too. It's well, every day is a gift. Yeah. That's one of the things you realize when you get to be 77 is any day you wake up on the right side of the grass is a birthday. <laughs> <laughs> and what a wonderful way to end the podcast today. So thanks oh. everybody for coming. We'll see everybody next Wednesday, same time, same place. We'll be here. Thank you so much. Happy birthday. Thank you. The Frequency Specific Microcurrent Podcast has been produced by Frequency Specific Seminars for entertainment, educational, and information purposes only. The information and opinion provided in the podcast are not medical advice, do not create any type of doctor-patient relationship, and unless expressly stated, do not reflect the opinions of its affiliates, subsidiaries, or sponsors, or the hosts, or any of the podcast guests or affiliated professional organizations. No person should act or refrain from acting on the basis of the content provided in any podcast without first seeking appropriate medical advice and counseling. No information provided in any podcast should be used as a substitute for personalized medical advice and counseling. FSS expressly disclaims any and all liability relating to any actions taken or not taken based on or any contents of this podcast. Please leave an honest review wherever you subscribe to this podcast.